Good morning, everybody, and how are you? Uh, please take your seats, and let's get ready for the morning's uh, program. <clears throat> My name is Bruce Buchanan, and I am the uh, director of the Business and Society program here at NYU Stern, and uh, the Center for Sustainable Business is part of our program, and I am thrilled to be here with you this morning, and just so pleased this conference is going on here uh, this week. Um, <clears throat> The, the issues that you're talking about are extremely important, and I think the university is uh, an excellent form in which to discuss them. The role of university and society is to try to find the truth, surface the truth, and teach it to our students. And the, the issues of sustainability in business are profoundly important, uh, currently still to some degree unresolved, and many, many people are working on them from many different areas of our society, and it's just... Uh, very good to see so many people from, from civil society, from corporations, from NGOs, from other schools here working with us and us today. Uh, I am here to do two things, uh, express some thanks and introduce our speaker. So I'd like to give, first of all, profound thanks to Tansi Whalen and her staff at the S Center for Sustainable Business. <laughs> for putting on this extraordinary program. I, uh, I really have been very impressed I was part of the standing room crowd yesterday, and I was very impressed with the, the depth and the quality of the discussions that we've had here, and more to come today. Um, I was looking at the title for this uh, uh, program and for the, uh, some of the sessions yesterday, and the focus on trying to build the case uh, for sustainability for finance, I think, is uh, an interesting title, and uh, I would like to think that five years from now or ten years from now, we'll have a conference on building the case for finance and sustainability. That, uh, <laughs> we will sort of turn this thing over and get the horse before the cart and uh, get that right. But for now, we'll build the case for sustainability for finance. Um, so I am very thankful for Tansi for putting this all together and her wonderful staff. Uh, I'd like to express, frankly, my sincere thanks to me for hiring Tansi two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> the, the Business and Society program has got a nickname in the, in the school. We're the, we're the Department of Interesting People, and I'm the only conventional business school professor in the department, so I am like the least interesting person in the Department of Interesting People and the chair, which I think actually there's a correlation there. Um, but it's just really very exciting to uh, see this going on and just look around the room, look at the energy, look at the ideas, and it's just great to be here today. So with all that, let me introduce our speaker, uh, Doug Beal, who is uh, from the Boston Consulting Group. And I must say, I've got an in with Tansi's staff, so they bootlegged me the slides last night, and you're in for a very interesting presentation. I, uh, I want to note that Doug, like me, is a former electrical engineer who came in off the farm, and uh, that gives it a very sort of technical and sort of rigorous uh, uh, flavor to it. So without further ado, our speaker, Doug, thank you. Good morning. Is this working? Yeah. Thank you. So, Tensi, thank you for the invitation. I think this is a great event. Um, I've been to a lot of these types of events, and this is the first one that I've been to that's focused on the topic of the internal measurement and the internal business case for it. I think that's so important, because as I'll show later, that is the area where we see the companies that we work with and the companies that we, we talk to you know, are furthest behind out of just about everything. So this is really an important topic and an important event. So um, I'm the director of, of Social Impact at BCG. Um, I'll give a brief introduction about what we do at BCG in Social Impact. It's all around working with our clients and two main sets of clients. One is social and environmental organizations themselves. So we work very deeply globally with Save the Children, with the World Food Program with the World Wildlife Fund and others. But an increasing a portion of our business is working with our big commercial clients on their own social impact strategies. So large corporations in many, many industries, investors on their own social impact strategies and ESG integration and how they do engagement, uh, as well as, uh, as development finance institutions, often development finance institutions in partnerships with, with corporations. Uh, and that is really what I focus my time on. About a year and a half ago, we uh, were actually sitting down with Bob Eccles, who you saw host one of the conferences, uh, one of the uh, panels yesterday, and we're kicking around some ideas because 
Bob and George Serafime and others had done a number of studies that you know, showed generally pretty strong correlations between general good ESG and better financial performance across a number of industries and across portfolios. But our clients are companies. And you know, CEOs of companies were saying to us, OK, but what does that mean for me as a pharmaceutical CEO? Or what does that mean for an oil company? You know, what specific ESG topics are most important for me? You know, and so we set out to try to figure out if you could identify what those were. Um, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. And when we started this project, we had no idea what we were going to find. We, you know, we had skeptics within BCG that said, look, we can't even get growth rates to correlate with valuation multiples. How are we going to find some of these ESG things, right? And I'll show you, we found some very, very positive, strong, uh, striking results. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with a bit of a perspective on the way we think of this topic. You know, we, it can be called sustainability or social impact or CSR. We call it total societal impact. I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on that because in a sense I'm sort of preaching to the choir. And so I think there's little that we can get out, get out of having that debate. Then I'll talk about the, our, our research itself and the analytics that we did. And last, I'm going to round it out with a discussion around, for a company itself, how do you really make this happen? You know, so you do good ESG. But sometimes companies that do good ESG and have a lot of really good programs, they still don't get the benefits and they don't get the value back. And so we, I spent about a year interviewing 250 people around the world from a number of different companies to dig into the operating models of companies and how do you build in societal impact into the operating models. So, you know, I think I won't spend much time on this slide. I think we all agree that this is an important topic, that millennials, that investors, that governments, you know, there's an acceleration that we see over, you know, really just the last couple of years as to the importance of this topic in the world. You know, and it's, it's in the press and people are talking about it. And I think I'm glad we're all here in the room today because I think we're a little bit out ahead of the topic. Uh, as it stands. You know, our philosophy behind this is, you know, you know, if you've got a, a group of smart people in a company, don't be ladling soup in soup kitchens. You know, use your core business. Use your core skill sets. The closer you can bring your social impact activities to your core business, leveraging your products, leveraging your services, leveraging your supply chain, the more benefits that you're going to generate for society and for the environment, and the more business benefits you'll be able to generate for you as a company. And this adds to shareholder value, and it also adds to the longevity of your company. We call it total societal impact, right? It's not something that's easy to measure, but really it's the, everything that a company does to create both positive and negative impact on society, the environment, and the economy. So it includes the products you create. I mean, most companies in the world, they're creating a product that brings good. Otherwise, we wouldn't be paying for it, right? It also includes the environmental impact of your operation. It includes the people you employ and your employment practices. Really, everything that you do contributes towards total societal impact. You know, and if you look at a two-by-two two matrix of societal impact versus total shareholder returns, you know, what we're really looking for is you know, what's in the upper right-hand corner here? How do you use your core business? Now, again, going back a few decades, you know, companies are creating some sort of good product. That's why we're buying it. But we were also externalizing some very bad environmental and social practices. We were dumping chemicals into the river. We were using you know, child labor in our supply chains. You know, and what did you start to see? You started to see that these practices eventually led something very bad happening, which can immediately destroy a lot of shareholder value. So what do you do? You counter that with corporate philanthropy. You know, you give money away. You create foundations. All very good, but there's a real question there of whether that's actually creating shareholder value or not. I suppose if you do it well, you link it to the topics that are relevant for your industry, 
you, um, you know, you're able to extract better brand value, maybe you're creating shareholder returns. But if you do it poorly, you're probably not, which is why we're saying, and I think we all agree in this room, use your core business. And you know, I think there were some folks in the room yesterday that are reflected on this slide. So uh, an increasing importance, and you know, you're just reading it in the news every day now. Um, the activist investors and the largest asset managers and other corporations putting pressure on their corporate partners on this topic. More and more important every day. So that lays out a little bit about our philosophy behind this. Now I'm going to get into the, uh, the research that we did. So spent about a year and a half on this. The first thing we did was a quantitative diagnostic of about 350 companies across five industries to look at the quantitative relationship between good ESG practices by industry and valuation multiples and margins. The second thing we did is we interviewed about 250 people around the world uh, that kind of surround this topic. So we talked to board members, we talked to CFOs, we talked to heads of marketing, we talked to business unit leaders. We talked to IR and policy people, really to get an understanding, engage what works and what doesn't work as you operate a company. We also talked to, with a lot of investors about how they are building in ESG into their investment decisions and try to unearth a little bit about the, um, the gap between what CFOs expect and what CFOs are providing investors and what the investors are looking to CFOs to do. So let me talk a little bit about our process and the, 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 the math behind what we did. So the first thing we said is, okay, we, we wanted to pick some industries that intuitively it made sense that this is an important topic, but that were very different. All right, and the five that we picked was oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, consumer goods, banking, and uh, high tech. Okay, all of them are regularly in the news on this topic. All of them, this is an important topic, but you know, the underlying important fact, ESG factors behind them all are gonna be very different. So those are the five we chose. We then said, okay, what are we gonna try to measure? What are the most important ESG topics by industry? So we started with SASB, which was brought up a lot yesterday. Great start. But we, we felt that though it was a little bit narrow, and in a sense, we wanted what is material to kind of emerge from our analysis rather than predefining what was material. Okay, so we, we, um, we started with SASB. We then interviewed our partners, the BCG partners in the industry practice. We talked to GRI. We talked to our friends at UCOM and MSCI, which were the two organizations where we got our data. And we created a, a matrix for each industry that sort of cut across environmental, social, and governance, and then sourcing sort of the inputs to the business, your internal business practices, and then your products, services, and distribution. And we populated these matrices for each of the five industries. And we had roughly, there was about 10 or 12 topics that cut across all industries. You know, for example, you know, gender equality in the workplace. But then there were about 10 or 12 topics that were very industry specific. So clinical trial safety in pharmaceuticals, for example, you're only gonna see that in pharmaceuticals. So that was our first step. We populated this matrix. We then worked with UCOM and with MSCI to identify data that we felt best represented how to measure what we were trying to compare against financials. And we mapped that data into our, into our matrix. And then we use that data to run multivariate regressions against valuation multiples and margins. And what we did here, we have a team called the Value Sciences team that for a couple of decades now has been working with our clients to understand and dig into the underlying drivers of valuations and, and, and of margins. Uh, and they run multivariate regressions in order to do so. And until now, they had not been including ESG factors. They were, you know, included growth rates and margins and tax rates and all those types of things that you would think would have an impact on your, your valuation multiple. So for the first time, they've added in the ESG topics to that analysis. And what we did is we actually then 
normalized for all the financial variables when we did this analysis so that we could isolate the specific relationship between each ESG factor and valuation multiples and margins so that we could really get rid of as much noise as we could. I'll talk a bit, a bit, a bit about now what we found. So let's start with valuation premiums, all right, with valuations. What we found in valuation premiums is that companies that did in the top quintile of good ESG practices had significant valuation premiums over companies that were average. So this is a comparison between the 90th percentile and the 50th percentile. Um, you know, 19% valuation premium in oil and gas. Again, holding all financial variables equal. This is very, very significant, all right? When you dig into what the individual ESG factors are that make up that 19%, 12%, so what, what individually contributed to those figures, this is what we found, all right? And if you look at these topics, and apologies for the small font, but if you look at these topics, they're all, they're primarily more downside risk mitigation oriented topics that are appropriate by industry. So, you know, responsible environmental footprint in consumer goods, you know, clinical trial, ethical clinical trials in pharmaceuticals, you know, combating corruption in oil and gas, and integrating environmental factors into credit risk analysis in banking, okay? You know, what you don't see here is some of the more, let's call it optional, socially oriented topics around inclusive supply chains, financial inclusion, uh, access to medicines, right? And we sort of said, why is that? When we talked to investors, they said, well, I think it's because these are the things that have been around for longer. You know, we've understood environmental issues, safety issues. These are the things that historically have showed up as having a significant impact on the way a company performs. So we're able to understand this and build it into company valuations. Now, when you look at margins, this is where we actually start to see more of kind of, let's call it the optional upside, more socially oriented topics, all right? So consumer goods, for example, inclusive supply chain, socially resp responsible sourcing. And let me, this is a topic that came up many times yesterday. Is this causal or is this correlations? We were not able to prove causality. This is correlations, but you saw a five percentage point gross margin difference between the companies that did that well and those that were average. Pharmaceuticals, access to drugs is arguably the most important thing that they can do from a social perspective. Eight percentage points. Now, we talked to, pharma, we talked to our pharma partners about that, and some of them were skeptical. What, you can't make money on access to drugs, you know? You know, but you talk to the companies, and they say, you know, yes, but in the long term, they look back at programs, access to medicine programs they started in, China 20 years ago. And they said, yeah, we didn't make money 20 years ago, but thank goodness for the person with the foresight to, to do that now, because now we're making $5 billion a year you know, in China, right? So I think um, what our colleague from Mars said yesterday, yes, often there is a longer term time horizon on this, right, on getting these benefits. You know, oil and gas, uh, health and safety, em employee training, and Banking, you know, promoting financial inclusion had a very, you know, small but statistically significant upside on margins, right? Now, I've just shown you about, about 20 positive correlations that we found. So probably you're asking, what were the negative correlations you found? We only found two negative correlations, both of them in banking. One was around diversity in banking. Why? I, I don't know. Okay, the other was around, uh, there was something else. But I mean, I think it was significant that we found about 30 statistically significant, meaningful correlations that were positive and only two that were negative. If this was just kind of random stuff, you'd think you'd find about the same, right? So we were quite, let's call it like pleasantly surprised by these, by these results. Um, and, you know, we what took... I think the other one was um, securing environmental factors into credit risk had a positive upside in banking, 
on valuation multiples, but had a negative correlation with margins. And that might be because banks are now turning down business that could be profitable in the short term with companies that are at risk environmentally, but in the long term could, uh, could, be, could be beneficial. Now, so when we went back to our value sciences team, you know, and we worked with our value sciences team on this, and these are kind of hardcore quant guys, okay? And these were the guys who were kind of like, are you sure we're gonna find these, these correlations? And I think we've, we've sort of proven <laughs> to them that this, this is meaningful. And so the plan now is that BCG, we're gonna systematically build in ESG into our valuation models. So anytime we work with a client, to help them understand what are the drivers of the valuation multiples, we're gonna build ESG into it. You know, here's an example in oil and gas. Financial variables, if you take ESG out of this, financial variables can predict about 74% of the valuation multiple of a, of a company, of an oil and gas company. If you add in ESG, it adds nine percentage points more predictable power. You know, and there's another 17% that still are unexplained. Now why? Like why do you see these correlations, right? Um, I think Tensi went into all of these very, very well yesterday in her introductory remarks. So I'm not gonna say anything more other than we agree with all the things you're, that you're analyzing. Now of course the tricky part is what's the cause and effect models of what you're doing that results in access to new markets, you know, that results in improved innovation, that results in talent improvement. And that's what the topic of, of this, um, of this uh, discussion is. So what we noticed, so we see these correlations, right? You think of a, a big matrix with a linear, you know, a diagonal line and a bunch of dots around it. We see that, but we also notice that some companies that did good at ESG, were below the line, meaning that their ESG performance was better than what the valuation premium that they were actually getting. You know, so they should have been getting a 10% bump and they were getting a 0% bump. And we're like, okay, why is that? You know, why would two companies that do the same quality of, of ESG or the same programs, why are some of them getting benefits and others not? You know, and, and I think that's because it, you know, it's important what you do, but it's just as important with what you do with that. Okay, you know, and the starting point, of course, is what are you, what are you doing? What are the initiatives that you're undertaking with your supply chain, with your products and services, with your human resources? That is really, really important. But you can do all of that, and then you kind of just drop it at that point. And there's a bunch of other factors that really matter to how you get benefits out of that, you know? And I'm gonna just highlight a couple of them here. One is, one of them is CEO leadership, you know, a topic that's come up in the last few weeks more and more. This is almost kind of binary, you know? We went and we talked with about 25 companies about this. You know, the ones where the CEO was showing active public leadership on this topic, you know, both with employees, standing on the stage at Davos, speaking at these types of events, you know, they were getting a lot of ben benefits. They were getting much more benefits. And when you talk to the kind of the CSR team or the sustainability team, they felt pretty good about their jobs and they felt pretty good about what they were doing and the kind of impact they were having on society and the company if their CEO supported them. But if the CEO didn't care, they were often a very, very frustrated group. So CEO leadership is important. You know, what's the narrative you're creating out of this? You know, you've got all these things going on. And, you know, most of the, company, most of the clients we work with, they're big companies, they, they do a lot. You know, big pharma companies, big oil companies, they're spending billions of dollars. They got tons of partnerships around the world. You know, often though it's fragmented, often there's a lot that's going on that they don't, they haven't really thought about and kind of reevaluated over the past couple of, you know, decades really taking a fresh look at what you're doing. How do you create a narrative that talks about that? Partnerships are often important. Um, don't go at this alone. Partners, both other corporations, uh, development finance institutions, NGOs, they can often bring skills, access to markets, they can lower costs. It's always good if somebody 
somebody like Save the Children is saying good things about you, it's better than you saying good things about you. And then, you know, right here, goals and measurement, which is the topic of today. I mean, we, we dug into this a lot with the companies that we met with. And I think what we found is most are doing a reasonably good job at measuring the external benefits to society and the external benefits to the environment of what they're doing. Very few, though, said that they had any idea about how to measure it internally and then tie those measures into the investor relations teams. Okay, I think what I heard yesterday was encouraging because maybe there's more going on than I thought based on the, uh, the discussions I've been having over the last couple of years. But in general, I think this is where companies are struggling the most and this is where the greatest value can, can be added uh, for all of us because you know, when you can demonstrate to your CFO and to your board that you're gonna be making some money on this, then obviously what you're doing is gonna be more scalable and, and much more sustainable. So thank you again, Tensi, for inviting. And I think this is a great, great event and such an important topic. And I think uh, one that should be, um, should be you know, focused on and dove into more, more and more. So I'll stop there. And I don't know how much time I have, but I'll open it up to, uh, to, to questions. Sure. Yeah. With that process. So I think some of this goes back to, yes, I will. Okay, the question was, well, you know, for companies that aren't doing well at this, what is the issue? Is it an internal resource issue? You know, is it a skills issue? Is it an internal resource issue? I think it's a couple things. One is historically, you look at, you know, every, just about every company has some kind of CSR department or sustainability department. And when we looked at, when we did this research, you see that that sits, can sit in like 10 different places within a company. Sometimes it's in policy, sometimes it's part of the IR team, sometimes it's part of human resources, sometimes it's part of strategy. Often where it sits is because of some historic event that happened five or 10 years ago and some smart person said, holy crap, we need a CSR department and it kind of was formed. Okay, you know, and it was formed basically to sort of react to some bad thing that happened. You know, okay, we had an issue with HR, we had an issue with an investor. Um, you know, it was kind of built with it within that mindset. Um, you know, and I think, you know, now then, you know, it's been focused historically. It's been more focused on showing the world that we're doing good things for the world. Okay. Um, is it a skill set or is it an investment? I think it's probably both. I mean, I think there's a recognition that this is really difficult to measure. So your normal models that you use to measure a project and the IRR of a project often can't be used when measuring social impact activities. It has, it's a longer time frame. You need to do surveys of employees. You need to look at case studies of what you've done in the past. I think often it's just difficult. Um, I've also heard, and particularly in Europe, when I talk to European companies, some of them say, we are not gonna measure the business benefits. That is not why we're doing this. We're doing this for society, you know? And you kind of get in a little bit of a, of a, of a frankly, a little bit of an argument, say, but isn't that gonna constrain then the, the ability for you to grow what those, what those programs are? So it's a, it's a combination of resistance, it's a combination of, um, yeah, I think of skill sets and investing the time and resource into doing that. Often, CSR departments are under-resourced, and the IR departments aren't doing this either. So it's a skill set that needs to be built and a capability that needs to be built in some sort of central group. Well, I think they. I mean, they have to. They certainly have to invest the time and the people in doing that. Um, I would say they should contact Tensi and her group and try to get, become part of their study. No, I'm seriously, I mean, what I heard yesterday 
And what I heard Tensi talking about is, is just about as good as anything I've heard in all of the discussions that I've had over the years. So. Sure. Hi. Okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, on, you know, in that. And, and are you seeing that changing in one? Yeah. You assume or you, you hinted that it may be. Yep. But the question of lack of knowledge and receptivity from the investor uh, is. Good question. So. I think the investors themselves are also evolving. So you take, you take a, a big asset manager or a big pension fund, you know, you've got groups within that organization. You've got an ESG team, and they get it, and they are on the journey of imparting into every portfolio manager the fact that this is important. All right? And so if you talk to a CFO within a company, some of them will say, look, investors never ask me about this. Okay? You know, and, but sometimes they do. And it also often depends on who within the asset manager you're talking to. Because if you're at a conference and you get a card from the ESG person, they're going to ask you about it. But maybe the typical portfolio manager that you know, is actually managing you know, your stock, maybe they're not asking about it. All right? But when we talk to the investor community, they say, look, regardless of whether we ask, the onus is on the corporation to explain to us. You know, be proactive about this. Put it in your, you know, you have your quarterly call, put something in there about this. What is it you're doing? What is your ESG performance? What are your, what does your societal impact programs look like? And how is that going to impact shareholder returns? Yeah. One more question. Okay. Sir. Uh, I'm Jerry Dodson. I'm the president of Barnass's Investments. Great job yesterday up on stage, by the way. Yeah. Uh, J Bob's a tough guy to work with, you know? So. <laughs> Yeah. How have you been able to do it? And you're well, doing a lot less we, yeah, so we, as I said, we didn't, we used UCOM and MSCI. All right, so we relied on their judgment. You know, obviously, some metrics like CO2 emissions, you measure with a number. Some, some like, you know, quality of safety programs, you know, you have to sort of have a smart analyst behind that that looks into what, what that's, uh, you know, what they're doing. So, um, that's, a, I think, I don't know if Ariana is here from OCOM. She's, no, she was sitting here a minute ago. She had to leave a minute ago. But, you know, I think we, we relied on the data providers. And, you know, there's, there's OCOM, there's MSCI, there's Sustainalytics, there's hundreds of them out there, right? And there is always a question about data quality. And it's not perfect, but good business leaders make smart decisions based on imperfect data, and the data is, is ideally constantly improving. <laughs>